I am uh, Carolyn De Benedictus. I am the chair of the newly formed ABD APDR Roundtable Committee, and I will also be your moderator today for this roundtable on the supplemental ERIS application and signaling for radiology. I know this is a topic I am very excited to hear about, um, and it's going to be a very important topic for all of us program directors to fully understand in the upcoming admission season. So first thing I would like to do is introduce our presenters. Our presenters today are going to be Jamie Bograd, who is the Director of Pilot Administra Administration for AAMC, and Dana Dunleavy, who is Senior Director of Admission, Selection, and Research and Development for AAMC. We will also be joined by some panelists, uh, Dr. Anna Rosenstein, from, who is the APDR President, Dr. Brent Griffith, who is chair of the Matching Planning Committee for APDR, and J Dr. Joanna Key Sampson, Sampson, who is the chair of the APDIR Matching Planning Committee. So the format for today is when I'm done my short introduction, we will have the presentation start uh, by Jamie and Dana for about uh, 20 to 25 minutes. And then at the end, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. Please enter your questions into the Q&A. We will be monitoring the Q&A. We will monitor the chat as well, but it's an easier format if we enter them into the Q&A. And we do have some pre-submitted questions, which we will also take um, in that 30-minute session as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dana Dunleavy and Jamie Bograd, who will be giving our presentation. Thank you again for joining us. Hi there, thank you for having us. Before we do begin, I just want to thank so much Anna and Brent and Joanna for all of their help and guidance um, when we've been, uh, I think we've been working together since November um, to try to make this happen for um, radiology, both diagnostic and integrated. So thank you for your hard work um, in, in, in helping us launch. So. Um, as uh, hopefully some of you know, we're going to be in the second year of the Supplemental ARIS application. We have three main goals, um, and they were the same for 2022 as they will be for 2023. The first is really to update questions on the ARIS application to reflect the current society and educational context. The last time the content of the ARIS application was updated was 1996. Maybe you'll remember that was also the first year of the electronic residency application service. So if we think back, we can identify many changes that have occurred in society and medical education training since then. So it's important for those changes to be reflected in the application residency selection process. It's really best practice and time for a change to the ARIS application. We've also heard from program directors in all specialties that you want to learn more about applicants' interests in non-academic and non-academic preparation for residency. Likewise, we've heard from applicants and advisors. They want you all to look at more than just their SEP score and a graduate of a certain medical school when deciding whom to interview um, or whom to invite for interview. So this SEP app is really designed to help applicants share more information about themselves and their journey. And finally, most of you are aware the current ARIS application makes it pretty difficult to review the whole application because it requires you all to search through many text-based fields. So we know that's not high, that's not really feasible in the high volume um, that some of you may all receive. And so we're trying to provide better and more structured information about applicants to drive holistic review. So we've decided to focus on three elements of the ARIS application, the experience section, the geographic preference section and program signals. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Dunleavy to talk about the evaluation plan and go through the content areas for the 2023 application cycle. All right, thanks Jamie. And thanks everyone for attending today. Um, we're excited to tell you a bit more about the supplemental ARIS application and to talk with you about it during the Q&A section. So over the next several slides, I'm going to describe to you um, two things. First, the evaluation plan and a short summary of some of the research that we've conducted thus far based on the first year. And then I will shift and tell you a little bit more about the content. So as you can see on this slide, our evaluation work is built around four pillars, fairness, validity, program director, and applicant reactions. 
we analyze data, conduct surveys, and we interview um, or conduct focus groups with program directors, um, applicants, as well as advisors to better understand their experiences taking the SEP app. Um, a full evaluation of any change to the selection process takes multiple years to complete because it takes time for outcomes like interview invitations, interview completion, and of course, performance data to accumulate. Um, as, I, as I hope you'll see when you hear about our um, work thus far, we are committed to transparency in our research and evaluation, and we'll continue to report out work um, and summaries of those results as they become available. This next slide summarizes the multiple methods that we've been using to evaluate and refine SUPAP based on what we've learned from year one and carrying it over into year two. Um, we have already taken a close look at applicants' responses to SUPAP questions um, from the first year of the pilot. We've used those data to help us understand and answer questions regarding fairness, as well as psychometrics. Um, We've surveyed applicants and advisors and program directors who participated last year to better understand how they use the tool, how we could improve it, and how we could improve our guidance to advisors and applicants. And of course, importantly, how we can improve the way that we share information with the program director community. Um, together, these data have been used to identify all of the changes that we have made for the content for year two, as well as the way the data are being provided to program directors in year two. We are towards the tail end of our first year evaluation plan. Um, at this point, we are turning our attention to collecting outcomes data. And now that the match has closed, we are exploring different avenues for um, obtaining information about interview invitation status. And we will look to see whether um, elements of the supplemental application add value in um, helping applicants, for example, increase their odds of interview or, and or help programs um, better identify applicants to invite to interview. So um, the next two slides cover some of the questions that came in advance. So I'll, I'll share some data to help answer those questions now, and then we can also return to these issues during the Q&A if necessary. Um, so this slide shows a breakdown of how applicants in year one responded to the geographic division preference question. And as you may remember, the question in SUPAP year one asked applicants to indicate up to three divisional preferences, or they could indicate they had no, no geographic preference or that they'd like to skip or not indicate a response. Um, as you can see from looking at this chart, we analyzed all our data separately by specialty because the applicant pools and the process differs by specialty. Um, between about 44 and 55% of applicants indicated the maximum number of geographic preferences, meaning they submitted three signals or three geographic um, preferences. Overall, about a third of the applicants did not have a geographic preference. However, we did observe some differences by race, race and ethnicity in this trend. Um, we learned that Black and Hispanic applicants were more likely to report no geographic preference relative to white and Asian applicants. And IMG applicants also were um, more likely to select no geographic preference. We don't know yet whether that um, response tendency um, affected folks' likelihood of interview. Um, so that's something that we are exploring as we continue to try to collect that interview data going forward into the spring. Um, we also, um, one other thing on that last slide, you guys might remember that um, applicants have the opportunity to describe why they have a particular preference for a region. And we did learn that about 70% of all the applicants who indicated a preference also provided a short essay uh, it's about 300 characters indicating why they had a preference for a particular region or indicating um, why they did not have a geographic preference. Um, so this next slide answers one of the questions that came in advance. Um, and this is um, a question around the um, whether preference or program signals were aligned with um, Excuse me, I apologize. Um, this question has to do with the density of programs in each of the geographic regions of the country that were included on the supplemental application. 
And what you see on this chart is a comparison between the density of programs in each, each region of the country, as well as the proportion of signals that that region um, obtained um, through sub-app year one. And what you can see through a quick skim here is that these two um, indicators are pretty well aligned. More, proportionately more signals went to um, regions of the country that had a higher density of programs. All right, and so with that, I'm going to shift gears and tell you a little bit about um, what SUPAP year two will um, entail. So as with last year, there are three sections of the supplemental application. These sections will be available to all applicants who participate in the supplemental application. Um, just as a reminder, participation in SUPAP is voluntary for programs as well as for applicants. And so this means that an applicant may choose to um, participate in SUPAP and respond to all questions, or they may choose to participate in SUPAP and respond to some questions or some sections. It also means that it's a program's choice um, whether they opt in or decide um, not to participate in the program. If you advise or if you um, interacted with folks who um, used SUPAP last year, you may remember that there was a fourth section. It was a research only section called work preferences. Um, we are continuing to study that section, but we have separated it from the supplemental application to make the process a little easier and less time consuming for applicants. So this year we'll continue to have past experiences, geographic preferences and program signals. The primary goal for the, for the past experiences section um, was to give applicants an opportunity to highlight their most meaningful experiences and to collect some new information that may be more actionable for you all and give you better information about how an applicant's prior experiences align with your, your institution's mission and goals, as well as what the applicant has in mind for their future career. Um, we also, the other goal for that section is to provide this information in a way that allows you to support holistic review. Um, so the next slide shows you um, a screenshot of, um, thank you, of what the past experiences section looks like in the supplemental application. So as Jamie mentioned earlier, um, for this pilot, the supplemental application is outside of the My Eris application. That's because we're trying out new questions and we wanna make sure that the questions add value before we build them into the My Eris system. Um, as a result, we're operating on this different platform. Here's what it looks like. Um, this is a screenshot for each of the five experiences. You can see that it starts with um, asking applicants to provide some administrative details around the experience. And then um, it asks them to provide tags and provide a little more description as to why a particular experience was meaningful. Um, this slide uh, shows you, I hope in a way that's easier to read, um, more information about the data that will be collected for each of the five meaningful experiences. On the left, you'll see those administrative details that are used to describe each experience. Those that are marked with an asterisk overlap with the existing My Eris application. Um, those that are not marked with an asterisk provide unique information that's separate from the My Eris application. Um, the frequency of participation and the setting uh, questions were administered in the first year of the pilot. They tested well. Folks thought that they provided useful and unique information, so we kept them. Um, as well as the experience type and the meaningfulness essay. Um, we wanted to attest the addition of two new questions in this section. Um, and you'll see those on the right shown in green. Um, and I'm gonna focus a little bit more on that on the next slide or the next few slides. So the next slide shows you the experience types. And again, this is a holdover from last year because it tested well. Um, for each experience, applicants are given the chance to describe their experience in one, using one of these different categories or tags. The ones marked with an asterisk exist in the My Eris application. The others are new. 
And these other experiences were used pretty widely by applicants in the first year of the pilot. And so we think that they offer an opportunity for applicants to better describe the experiences that were important to them and also make it easier for you all to identify folks who may have engaged in um, particular types of experiences that could be of value without having to read lots of text. In addition to experience type, we're including these two new tags. The first is primary focus area. Um, and you can, you can see that these focus on disciplines or areas of study. And the idea behind this is that um, we observed that applicants write or wrote a lot about um, these different disciplines or areas of focus that were important to them in their meaningfulness essays last year. Um, we also know that given the volume of applications that you receive, you often don't have time to read through a large volume of essays for, um, for, for thousands of applicants. And so the thinking here was that applicants may be able to easily tag the experience and you all will be able to find that more quickly and then decide whether you'd like to read more about it after you've seen this tag. The second tag is what we're calling a key characteristic tag. And again, we saw in applicants' essays from last year um, that applicants were really trying hard to identify particular um, characteristics that they either demonstrated or developed through various experiences. But that really rich information was buried in their narratives. And so by pulling out this tag, it, gets, it gives you an opportunity to um, identify more quickly characteristics that might be of value to your institution. <clears throat> um, as with last year, we continue, um, we continue to offer an opportunity for applicants to write short 300 characters describing why an experience was meaningful. For year two of the pilot, we are trying a slightly different prompt. Um, our thinking here is that the prompt that you see on the screen will better focus applicants on the information that programs are interested in and will give them an opportunity to elaborate on why a particular key characteristic or focus area was meaningful to them. Um, what we learned from last year is that many applicants wrote um, about uh, what the experience entailed rather than why it was important or meaningful. Them. And so we're trying to refocus by narrowing the prompt. And we think that will um, cause the essay to add more value. So with all of these tags, um, uh, experience type, primary focus, and key characteristic, we believe that the SUP app gives applicants an opportunity to highlight important characteristics of their experiences and make that information at the forefront of the application review rather than buried in a narrative. Um, as a result, we think this will help you all quickly identify different types of applicants. Um, we're viewing these tags as a collection. Each experience will be assigned an experience type, but some applicants may choose to tag an experience with a focus area and a characteristic. Others may choose to um, tag an experience to one um, particular focus area or one particular characteristic. Across the set of five experiences, our hope um, is that these different tags will give you um, a sense of what an applicant is passionate about and what they bring to the table um, and how well they may align with your program. And that that, that more complete picture will be, able, um, will be able to be processed more easily because it's based on tags and allow you to direct your attention for further narrative review based on the set of applicants that you think um, that best meet your program's needs. We'll continue to include the other impactful experience essay. Um, you all know that this is an essay that gives folks an opportunity to describe any hardships they've overcome on their journey to a career in medicine. Um, we also know that um, not all applicants will respond to this question because some haven't experienced substantial hardship, um, and that's okay, and we're communicating that to applicants as well. The next set of questions are around geographic preferences. Our primary goal for the geographic preference section is to standardize information about applicants' desire to live and work in a certain location. 
we know the existing MyEris application is lacking in this area and that you're often left to make inferences about applicants' geographic preferences based on their home address or where they attended medical school. Um, we think that's unfair to everyone, <laughs> you all included. Um, and in fact, from the data you saw earlier, um, about 20 to 44% of applicants across the participating specialties last year reported that they had no geographic preference or had a preference for a region that was not their home um, affiliated region. This slide um, shows the questions in the geographic preference section. So as you can see, the country is divided into nine different census divisions. They're a little hard to read on this map, um, but there are nine of them listed and um, applicants are given the opportunity to indicate up to three. They can also indicate they have no, no divisional preference if perhaps another area of interest is more important to them than geography. And of course they have the opportunity to skip the question. Um, applicants will also have the chance to describe why they may have an interest in a particular region or division of the country. So I believe this also was a question that, that came pre-populated. Um, this slide shows what information will be shared with you all as program directors. Um, so reading from left to right across the screen, um, if an applicant indicates a preference for your program's division, you will simply see the word yes in the PDWS. If an applicant indicates a preference for another division, no information will be displayed. It will be blank. Um, if an applicant indicates no regional preference, you'll simply see the term no regional preference. And if an applicant skipped the question or did not participate in subapp, no information is displayed. So um, in order to give a little protection to applicants here, you're not able to differentiate whether the applicant signaled another region of the country or if they simply um, skipped the question and opted out of the geographic preference section entirely. There's also a question that gives applicants a chance to indicate their preference for an urban or rural setting. Um, as you can see, we, um, we give them an opportunity to indicate that they have no preference. Um, this is a slightly revised question from last year. Originally, this was broken into two questions. And when we did that, we saw that most applicants had a preference for both an urban and a rural <laughs> environment. Um, we know that's not likely true. And so we're attempting to um, uh, improve the value of that question by trying out this different format. Next is the program signal section. As you guys already know, signaling is um, a way or a process in which applicants can express interest in a residency program at the time of application. And it's important to remember that signals really are only appropriate for use in deciding as one of many data points in deciding whom to invite to interview because people's preferences can change over time and based on experience on interview day. Um, the next two slides are really just a screenshot of what these questions look like in the supplemental application system. Um, remember we're outside of the My Eris system and the SUPAP deadline is a couple weeks before Eris applications officially start flowing to programs. And so what that means is we need to ask applicants about their intention to apply in a specialty. So the first question in this section asks them where they intend to apply. And so in this example, we have the applicant has selected diagnostic um, or interventional radiology and or. And when they select that, another question will unfold. And this um, lists the six signals that are available to um, radiology applicants. And they'll use that drop down button to select the institution to which they'd like to send their signals. If an applicant were applying to multiple specialties, they would have indicated that on the prior slot on the prior question, and they would have multiple opportunities to respond. So if I were applying um, in radiology as well as pediatrics, um, you would see another set of questions um, appear regarding pediatrics. So much like the geographic um, information, we are careful in the way we display this program signal information to program directors. So again, reading from left to right, if an applicant sent a signal to your program, you will simply see the word yes. 
if they did not send a signal to your program or if they opted out of this section, um, no information would be displayed. So you don't have a way of differentiating. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie to walk you through the logistics. Hello again. Okay, so there are 16 specialties with around 30, um, 3,100 potential programs that are going to participate, which we'll talk about in the next. Um, we are inviting all applicants to complete the SUP app. Um, with over, we into 43,000 will participate. My internet just went unstable. Can you hear me okay? Okay, sorry about that. Um, as Dana's mentioned a few times, the supplemental application is still separate from the MyERIS application. So they'll complete the main MyERIS application. And if their specialty is participating, they'll then complete the SUP app. Um, they, um, they don't have to complete the SUP app and the main MyERIS application at the same time. They do not have to submit at the same time. The tool is free for applicants and the tool is also free for programs. Um, to take a look at the timeline, um, we already posted the complete list of participating specials, specialties in March, and we published the list of final um, dates. In a few short weeks, uh, with the help of uh, those that I mentioned earlier, we will be publishing our applicant guide, including question content and an application worksheet for applicants to begin working on. So it has all of the uh, details that Dana shared with you um, so that maybe we know that many of you are also specialty advisors so you can use that and work with your applicants as well. We'll host an advisor webinar on May 12th and an applicant webinar on May 19th uh, just to um, talk a little bit about what we talked about with you today, share uh, data from year one to help enrich the guidance uh, for advisors in year two. Um, in uh, July 1st, um, that week, we'll post the participating uh, programs um, based on which, um, so if your specialty is joining like you are, you also have the option to opt in to participate in the SUP app. I know that your specialty is encouraging you all to opt in because that is also how program signals um, become more valuable. And we'll talk about that in a second. We'll also publish program resources and we'll have a program webinar on June 14th at 1 p.m. for all programs that are participating. On August 1st, the supplemental AROS application opens. On September 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern time, the supplemental AROS application closes. All of the data in the supplemental AROS application will be available to you all through the PDWS when it opens on September 28th. Are you talking about the resource? I think your internet went out, Jamie. I can I can take over from here since Jamie's having unstable internet. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, excellent. All right. So I think Jamie um, Jamie mentioned the program resources, which are currently listed at least on the slide that I can see. Um, we will be providing these resources both for applicants and for advisors, um, as well as for you all on the program side. So you all will have information um, to help you think about how to incorporate the supplemental application into your process. Um, you'll also have information that will help you navigate these new sections in the PDWS. Um, importantly, we'll do another webinar on July 14th which will give more information um, about how to use the PDWS and how to think about incorporating this information into your system. Um, this next slide that Jamie pulled up is the program registration slide. Um, this is a mock-up of what you all will see when you enter the ARIS system to register your program for the upcoming cycle. So this system is open as of now. Um, and you will, once you enter the system, you'll see a page that looks very similar to this. Um, and through, um, through the ARIS EAM system, you'll have until July 1st to sign up for the supplemental um, ARIS application. And when you go through these pages, you'll also be able to see the terms and conditions and you'll be asked to agree to those terms and conditions prior to, um, to completing the registration. 
The next slide shows um, a call out of the program agreement, particularly the code of conduct that's most important for the supplemental application. There are three primary rules that we wanna make sure folks are aware of. Um, first is that programs shall not disclose the identification of any applicants who have signaled them. Second, they should not ask interviewees where they have signaled. And you, we're also requesting that you do not disclose the number of signals that you have received. Um, as you will learn once we go through the program director training in June, um, it is appropriate to ask folks who have signaled you for more information about why they signaled your individual institution. Um, but we really do um, request and require that you um, refrain from asking questions like that to folks who did not signal your program. Um, also a reminder, signals both the geographic divisional preference as well as the program signals are appropriate only for use in the interview phase um, because of course people's preferences can change over time and we wouldn't want you all to um, miss an applicant who may not have sent a signal but then loves your program after interview day um, or we wouldn't consequently want um, want you to make an assumption about someone's level of interest um, if that has changed post interview day. Um, this next slide is a screenshot of what you will see in the PDWS once it opens towards the end of September. Um, this is still a mock-up, so we're working on it to make sure that it, um, that it looks good and is easy for you all to use. Um, but there are two main points we'd like to make as you look at this now. Um, First is that um, we listened to feedback from the participants last year. Um, last year, the supplemental application data was delivered in a separate dashboard, and it was really difficult for folks to access. Based on that feedback, we, with help from the ARIS team, were able to put these data into the PDWS. Um, I think we have lost Jamie, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you all can see. Um, see that present, that mock -up. Oh, there we go, Jamie, thank you, it's back. Um, so of course, we, we continue to listen to the community and um, try to learn from you all to make improvements to the system. Um, the second thing to point out here, as you can see with the two red boxes, um, is that all of the information from SUPAP is covered in this display. Um, the larger box on the top left or middle left contains the program signaling as well as the geographic preference information. That data is sortable and filterable as well as being easy to see. And then um, the information from the past experiences is summarized in the SUP app tab. Um, on the next slide, what you'll see is a blowout of that SUP app tab. And you can see, again, this is just a mock-up, but you can see that you'll be able to pretty easily scroll up and down and um, see descriptions as well as read those meaningful experience essays. And with that, we will um, conclude this part of the presentation and open the floor for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. So should we start with the, um, we'll start with the uh, Q&A. So the first question is, if they pick three geographic preferences, do they get to describe why for each of the preferences? And if so, do the PDs get to see all the text boxes for each preference? Sure, this is a good question. And I think I, I failed to address this up front. Um, so yes, so applicants um, do have the opportunity to provide an essay uh, description of why they selected each particular region, but that information is only shared with the with the division to which it is relevant. So for example, if my program is in the Northeast and an applicant um, wrote a Northeast essay, I would see that, but I would not see their Mid-Atlantic essay. Wonderful, thank you. Is there a word limit on the essay response for each experience? Yes, so we do, um, we actually use character count limits. And so for those meaningful experiences, they're kept to 300 characters. Um, with that, we did test that last year, and that um, amount of information seems to be about right at the moment. Um, applicants typically use the full 300 characters. Um, we'll see with this different, narrower prompt whether that still holds. 
um, for that 300 character limit also applies to the geographic essence. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna get through the Q&A ones first and then we will move on to the chat ones. In the, in the research you have done so far, do you notice that programs that get a lot of signals tend to only interviews those that gave the program a signal, thus people that don't give a signal to, don't, don't give that program a signal have little chance to get an interview? We don't know the answer to that yet based on the data from the first year of the supplemental application because we're still collecting interview um, invitation data. Um, but we do know from the folks over in ENT that um, sending a signal does increase an applicant's um, odds or likelihood of being invited to interview. So we're, we are actively doing the work to see if that finding holds. Dana, you might want to also mention um, the signal usage last year that the majority of yes um thank you yeah i think the relevant point here is that um last year we did see that um about 25 percent of the programs received about 50 percent of the signals so um for some programs um particularly programs who receive um, a small proportion of signals relative to their applications um you know, by definition, they're not going to be able to only invite folks who signaled them. Um, so they're, and likewise on the flip side for those programs that received um, signals from the vast majority of their applicants, they're not able to use those signals as a way to pull down their list because so many of their applicants sent them. Thank you. That's very helpful. Is urban defined for the user? So the applicant, I'm assuming in this case, or yeah. Yes, it is. So in that applicant guide that Jamie was mentioning earlier, we um, list all the questions and when it's appropriate, we also provide definitions. For urban and rural, we, um, we defer to the U.S. Census definitions. I think for urban, um, let me see, yeah, um, we describe that as 50,000 people or more in a continuously built up and densely populated area. Great, thank you. Can they send a sig can they send signals at a later date, i.e., not when the supplemental application is initially fill filled out? So could they give three initial signals and add three later? Um, uh, Jamie, would you take that one for me, please? Sure. So the application is only open from um, August 1st to September 15th. So as long as they haven't submitted their application, they can. Um, add signals at any time up to the sixth. But once the application closes or they've already submitted their application, they can't make any changes. Um, you know, remember that this process is for interview invitation. And so, you know, if, if not that we will be doing it, but if we were to have opened up the application, people could, you know, submit their signals, change their signals, and it would be very confusing to program directors as who, is to, who has done the signal. So up until September 16th, they can signal up to six um, interventional and diagnostic radiology programs um, and or once they submit, those are final. But if they wanna start with three and not submit their application, then they, they can do that. So just to, just, to answer, just to clarify a little here. So if, if program directors do not look at the signals until the deadline, nothing is gonna change once the deadline is hit, so. Correct, the program directors won't have access to the PDWS. Oh, so it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, so, so for program directors, they can't know if someone at, at the beginning of the application process put it in versus the end because it's all gonna only be visible to you once they can't alter it. Yep, and you will not see the date on which they submitted or whether they put it first or whether they put it sixth, you will just see that they signaled the program. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you very much. Not directly related, but for an ERIS update, we would certainly appreciate it if publication section did not lump abstracts with publications. Uh, those are very different from our perspective. Okay, so that's kind of a feedback thing. So I don't think we have to answer. Uh, you guys can take that as feedback back to ERIS, please. Uh, I have students interested in IR ask if they should apply to DR as well. Can you describe how that would work in relation to program signaling? Is there going to be one signal for IR DR programs? 
is there going to be one signal for IRDR programs? Also, would supplemental app be used for prelim year? These are great questions, and these are some of the questions we discussed very early on with your specialty leadership, and there um, was almost identical um, applicants in the DR and IR pool. So what that means is that the vast majority of applicants that applied to IR had also applied to DR, which is why it was really, um, we thought valuable to have those signals together. So it is six total. You can do all six in diagnostic radiology. You can do all six in interventional radiology. Um, or, you know, you could vary that um, depending on, you know, what the applicant's preference is. Is it more important that they are at a, at a specific program or is it more important that they're in that, 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 that specialty um, or more valuable to them for the program signal? So I think that that's going to be an, an advising question and something you all might help with um, if you're providing any additional language to um, applicants but um, it is one signal for interventional and diagnostic radiology together. And I assume that the prelim year, it's all up to the medicine or surgery programs that do it. Yeah, so if, if it's a prelim year that's outside radiology, if so just, just so you all know, internal medicine, if it, that's the prelim year, internal medicine, they um, are only doing categorical um, program signals, you will not be, you know, they will not do prelim year, um, even for program signals. Um, surgery is participating, but you won't see their signals. You'll only see signals for your program, your radiology, your diagnostic radiology program, or your interventional radiology program. I know that the program directors overlap significantly in those fields. So you might have to toggle back and forth in the PDWS for that information. And so, so essentially, they if if those if those programs, let's say, so medicine isn't, but let's say surgery is using signals for their prelim. Those are separate from the six they get for radiology. Correct. Yep. Making sure everyone has it clear. All right. What does an applicant do if their circumstances change after the suppl supplemental application is closed? I.e., if between September sixteenth and December they decide that some geographic preference isn't any preference anymore and a different one becomes it. Well, I think I know the answer to that, but you guys can say. <laughs> Dana, do you yeah, want I, me to say <laughs> Okay. I, I mean, it, it is, right? At the time of application, this was your preference. Um, it is really supposed to be just one indication. Um, like, you know, I think Dana says it best, like this isn't the silver bullet. This is just another tool in which you can use to help evaluate whether or not you want to interview an applicant and for them to share their preferences with you so they're not inferences. If they change, they change. Um, and there, there's really, there's nothing they can do in the application to um, alert you of that. And they don't have to accept an interview. That's the other thing they can do if they no longer wanna to go to that region, I guess. All right, will programs be able to sort their thousand plus applications for those that signaled the program? Good question. Yeah, so I think the question is about sorting and filtering and you will be able to sort and filter for geographic preference and uh, program signal preference this year in the PDWS. Thank you. When the EAM window closes, will programs be able to opt in? No, so once July 1st hits, um, that is the closing date for registering for the SEP app. If you aren't registered by then, your program, so when we showed you that drop down of, of the six drop, those, that's where the program information will do, be displayed. So both interventional and diagnostic radiology programs will all show up in that drop down. And if you have not indicated by July 1st that you're participating, um, then you, you you won't receive any of the data. Um, it's also really important that you know what you're getting into because if you do sign up, there's no opting out after July 1st. This is so that we can protect the applicants and provide them all the relevant information. They wouldn't want to utilize a signal that you're not gonna review. Smart. What percentage sorry, of programs received no signals? Dana, I don't know if you can answer that question. Yeah, I don't have the exact number, but I, I saw this in the chat, so I pulled up our report. Um, 
I'm just going to give you a ballpark based on a histogram. <laughs> um, it looks to me less than 10% of dermatology, um, definitely less, probably more like less. Uh, yeah, the others, the others, um, the scale on the y-axis is too big, so I can't give you a good estimate. Um, um, but that's something that we can look into and we can um, report back out to your specialty leadership to answer that question. Thank you. I had a repeat question, are IR and DR considered separately? We already covered that. You get six signals for both IR and DR total. They are not separate. So just to answer that again. Uh, another one, do you think the applicants that answer no geographic preference really do not have a preference or do they think they just don't want to have some programs not consider them thus slimming down their interview chances? Yeah, we have a question about this too. Um, we conducted a post um, SUPAP survey last year and we saw that the majority of applicants who responded to the survey indicated that they were truthful in their responses to the geographic question as well as the preference signal question. Um, that was just a sample of survey respondents. Um, so one of the reasons we are interested in changing up the format of that question is to see if we, um, we do see a distribution of responses that might be more um, aligned with what we all think is truth. Um, if we learn that um, the bulk of applicants skip or select no preference, and that question does not have value to you all as program directors, um, then it's a question that would not survive this pilot. And we're only interested in moving content forward that is psychometrically sound and adds value. Wonderful. In a program with a population of 100,000, current definition of urban, I assume a program in an area with a, I was like, who has 100,000 residents? In a program in an area with a population of 100,000, current definition of urban, which I think I heard was greater than 50,000 does not appear to help. In our post feedback, in our post interview feedback, when medical students prefer urban, they are thinking of higher population density, such as Chicago, New York, Dallas, St. Louis, et cetera. Is there some thoughts on changing the definition or stratifying more? Yeah, uh, not for this year. Um, so for this year, it's set because of our timeline and the amount of time we need to build and launch. Um, this is something that we did think about. Um, we elected to keep with the original definitions since they were based on the census. Um, the census really sticks with those two definitions. They don't have a suburban or a large and small urban definition. Um, and our perspective was that um, we should go with a common definition and have that be based on folks who have expertise in population mapping, um, not testing experts, which is what we are. So, um, so for now, that is what the definition we're using. It's something that we are keeping an eye on, though, because this question has come up multiple times. Thank you. Uh, what program characteristics describe the programs that receive the majority of signals, if you can answer that? Yep, I can start to answer that. We're still um, looking through um, some of the program characteristics that we have available. But we know that, of course, you saw from a prior slide um, that certain geographic regions received more signals um, that held as well for program signals, not only geographic location. So um, larger programs, um, programs that were in regions that had higher density, programs that are affiliated with R1 um, or university affiliated institutions, um, those were all typical um, programs that received a larger number of signals, um, programs that had a larger um, size in terms of the number of, um, of uh, trainee positions that were available. Um, we, are, we are going back to look to see how that relates to the number of the application volume. Um, and we're also going back to look to see how that relates to um, ratings on doximity. Um, we know from ENT that programs that had a higher rating um, were more likely to receive um, more signals. Um, although, you know, we are at, as AMC, we're agnostic on, on these ratings, but um, we do think that's important information for you all as programs to have as you think through how to incorporate the ratings um, and what they might, excuse me, the signals and what they might mean to you in your process. Thank you. Why change advice on signaling home institution program? Um, so I can start. Oh, Jamie, would you like to answer? 
Sure. Um, there were uh, several reasons. Um, one is that applicants were confused. Applicants, you know, the program signals are to say, where am I most interested in attending? And so they really wanted to use that signal to the institutions that they most want to attend and some were their home institutions. So that's um, was probably our, 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 you know, our that was one of the biggest questions we got from applicants. Um, we also have some of our specialties or many of our specialties um, simply don't have enough interview spots for away and home institution um, applicants. And so they want to know who truly wants to interview. Um, and then the third was that um, from an operational perspective through the PDWS, you have access to this information. And that's also how many of you do your admissions processing. So you could... Um, inadvertently uh, not seek out these students um, or miss these students when you're processing your application. So that those were the three main reasons why we cho chose to change our guidance. Thank you. Would a program be able to tell that an applicant has applied to multiple specialties? The only way they might be able to do that um, for, for you all is something they could already do, right? If they are the program director for both diagnostic and interventional, they would already see that through um, the PDWS because they can toggle back and forth between the applicant. They would not be able to see any other specialties just like the PDWS works today um, through this new supplemental ARIS application. Thank you. Are you allowed to let your own institutional faculty interviewers know if an applicant signaled your program? Is it permissible to show them the supplemental application information to faculty interviewers if you are interviewing the applicant? Yes. Um, so from our perspective, anyone who is involved in your selection process and your application review process um, is permitted to um, access the supplemental ARIS application information. Um, in this particular example, I think if, if I were training those interviewers, I would just remind them that the lack of a signal does not mean necessarily lack of interest and we shouldn't make assumptions um, about applicants um, in the way that they chose to signal months before you're coming to interview. Thank you. If you change the geographical question to have the applicant list what if you change the geographical question to have the applicant list their top two or three regions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now they can indicate their top three. Um, we settled on three because applicants had positive reactions to that last year. And we did see a spread across those different geographic regions. I think as we go forward with the SUP app, um, we're going to continually be monitoring how applicants interact with these questions. Um, the first year was novel, and we'll see if new strategies to kind of game the system or strategize um, take place between year one and year two, and we would adjust to the extent that we can um, based on new data. So um, I, I think that's something that can be on the table for the future as we see where the data takes. Wonderful. Is there any problem with the program telling their own students that they don't need to signal their own program? So um, Anna and I talked, or Anna and Dana and I talked a little bit about that earlier. And um, I, think, I think it needs to be really clear to the applicant what they should do. Um, and so, you know, right now the for radiology interventional and diagnostic is to signal the programs you're most interested in and that is absent of you know there is no recommendation to not signal your um, home and away in-person rotation um, if a program director wants to have a specific uh, conversation with a specific applicant um, you know as long as it doesn't violate any rules I, we, we can't we can't dictate we can't there's nothing in, technically that we can do to the application to prohibit or inhibit that behavior. Um, but I would just advise you all to be uniform um, so that it's not confusing to the applicants or their advisors. So, so for example, just let me put this out there. I always interview, no matter how bad they are, or good they are, I interview all of the ones from our medical school because we're a primary school, primary care school and most people don't go into radiology anyway. So it's a small number. 
So am I allowed to pull them all aside in a group meeting who are applying and say, hey, don't waste one of your signals on us. We interview you all anyway, you know, something like that. May I yep. chime in Go for it. question? The APDR will follow the AMC recommendation of signaling all programs. However, we all understand that programs are different. And specifically, some programs um, may be located, maybe, you know, if you have one medical school and one program, that's very different from one medical school and multiple programs, up to seven, as we know. And so one institution, one program situation may not want to see the signal from their students because they will interview them all, okay? At this point, obviously, such institution is free, there's no mandate, to go to actually recommend something different than the AMC um, recommendation. However, it has to be absolutely crystal clear to medical students. Transparency is important. Therefore, we strongly recommend that whatever you choose, you should put it clearly on your website communicate this information to the advisors, medical student advisors, and to the medical students. So as Jamie said, there is no miscommunication and your medical students know what your preferences are. And if you allow them to skip signaling, right, they need to be clear, right, and not confused. I think Jamie and Dana's and AMC issue here is you know lack of confusion transparency everybody is on the same page so as long as you maintain transparency between you and the medical students and i'll add one other thing to that anna thank you for saying that so clearly which is um i think if your if your program opts to go in this route make sure that you're talking and training your interviewers in the same frame so that they don't mistakenly view that negatively when they're reviewing an application. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, we have gone through all of the relevant questions in both the chat and the question boxes. Um, so, and we have literally less than a minute left. So since there are no other questions, I would like to really thank uh, our speakers, Dana Dunleavy and Jamie Bograd for all that amazingly helpful information, which I will send out a summary of as always in the next week or two for people to have. Uh, and also thank you to our panelists, Joanna Key Sampson, uh, Brent Griffith, and Anna Rosenstein. Thank you so for thank having you. you know how to reach us if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Absolutely. And thank please. you all again. And please send me and Brent all the questions you might have. You can use the list serve. We will be constantly communicating with you. We'll answer all your questions in as real time as possible. And yes, we'll be reminding you to opt in continuously. Those of you who don't opt in, you'll hear from us because we would like to you know, remind you. Wonderful. Bye, everyone. Thank you all.